a quienes dejaron su tierra les dedico esta canción les dedico esta canción a quienes dejaron su tierra in july i will be 100 where were you born in uh, creole springs illinois it was at the 80 acre farm you know he raised corn soybeans wheat uh, all kinds of fruit apples pears everything good to eat <laughs> as a child my older sisters uh, had dates of course their dates would always bring me candy i've told uh, about it before <laughs> but the uh, little tangos that uh, were candy and I didn't get very often. And I guess they sold for a nickel. And so, and so was a loaf of bread, expensive. But we had lots to eat, good things. I left at se age 17. I, um, I knew there was no future for me there. And uh, I had no money. But um, my stepmother encouraged me to get my education and, and have a career. I told my dad that I was going to Chicago and he was against it. And uh, I said, well, if you don't give me the money to go, I am going to run away. And so he gave me the money and uh, put me on the train. It was an all night ride to Chicago. And then a friend who used to live in Southern Illinois was meeting me at the train. I had a job before I left of taking care of a, a person's house. It didn't seem to be the thing for me, but uh, I found another job with uh, taking care of a little five-year-old boy. Well, this wasn't exactly acceptable either because he was very spoiled. Um, I had worked for a, a Jewish family because I left it first and I, I just couldn't take it any further. It was about an hour away from my school, but I, I did it anyway. They were wonderful people. And uh, they had a little girl that I, I just loved. She, she was only 13 months old. She was a baby, but she was a doll. And so were her parents. They were so good to me. What was Chicago like for, uh, for you at that time? It was a, a scary place. Well, you heard so much about gangsters, and uh, God protected me. He was really, I look back on my life, and I think, my goodness, his hand was with me all the way. I stopped one day on a Lakeview Avenue there was a hospital there, and I thought, I, th I wanted to be a nurse. And I said, so I'll go in and just see if, if there's any way that I can be a nurse. And I asked to speak to the superintendent of nurses. They um, directed me to her. She was a little short lady, a nun, uh, all dressed in black, of course. She had black eyes, and she looked me right at through. And uh, she said, why do you want to be a nurse? I said, oh, I'd like to help people, and I'd like to have an education. Is there any way that I can go through nurses' training and pay for my tuition after I get out and earn the money? She said, yes, you can. And so that's how I got to my training. It was more hands-on at that time. Now we had to learn our med medicines, which were not as uh, numerous as they are today. Uh, things are much more uh, cut and dry today. But um, they taught us to teach each patient as if that patient were Jesus Christ. And if you have to, and if you do that, you're going to do your very best for that patient. And when a patient would become very ill and need counseling and help, uh, um, a nun would come in. And I remember she put her hand under the pillow and as she prayed for that patient. And the 
that really touched you because you knew that that prayer was going straight up. We would get up early because we had to be uh, at work at seven. And so we had breakfast and then took care of whatever we had to do and went to work. But we always had to go to chapel before we went to work. Although I was Protestant, I value that, that experience. And uh, we had prayer in the chapel. The chapel just seemed a, a holy place. And uh, it was a very strengthening thing, morally and spiritually for, for we nurses. Well, I was doing private duty there in the same hospital. Oh, okay. Uh, that way I was earning a little living. But we worked 12 hours for $8. Well, it's after a few months of private duty, and uh, people would come up to me, the doctors, in, ma in fact, asked me if I was going to keep on nursing, and, and uh, they said, well, you know, they're asking for stewardesses on the airplanes, and they have to be registered nurses. And so that gave me a idea. They were very fussy <laughs> in those days. We treated passengers as royalty, believe me. We served them filet mignon, and um, they had, sometimes they had a little champagne, and it was all gratis, you know, with their ticket. Well, how did you meet your, your first husband? He was a pilot on the plane. What type of plane was it? <laughs> a DC-3. <laughs> It was all right. It was, um, uh, if you got in rough air, you better keep, keep your seatbelt on. And I, that's true today. But um, I was tossed around. A storm came up pretty uh, fast, and the captain didn't have time to tell us to get our seatbelt fastened. He had just turned it on, and I was trying to get my passengers f fastened before it got bad. And all of a sudden, I hit the top of the plane. And I came down on the side of my body, and um, apparently there wasn't any serious, but it, it was frightening. American Airlines. It was, uh, they called it AM-18, between Boston, New York, and Washington. So I met um, Governor Dewey, and he got, as he got on the plane, he shook hands with me, and he was just as friendly as could be. And I've had Kate Smith on my board. Kate Smith was, had a fur coat on and a diamond that would choke a horse. <laughs> she was a songstress in those days, and uh, she was very popular. What was Mr. Cheney's duties during the war? He was pilot. He, he brought the wounded back from Europe, mostly. Well, he was gone for 19 days. Usually he was gone and come back, you know and I, he wouldn't be home. But he's gone for 19 days. I didn't hear from him. And so finally he did get home. And he had been to the Yalta Conference. And uh, he flew our ambassador, uh, Caffrey, who, from, to, um, who was an ambassador to um, France, to the Yalta Conference. I think it's 43, yeah. Okay. He went back with American. He was uh, on loan to the government from American during the, bringing the wounded back. We, we bought property in um, Rancho Palace 30s. Only we were the Saddleback part of that. And it was a, um, you had to go through a gate to get into it. But we were up on Saddleback Road. We, we built a house, uh, just enough to live in. It was, it was nice. And um, we were living in that, and then we had a plan, and it was going to be uh, quite nice. And the view was magnificent. And I, would, I lived here today because, my, see, my husband was, an atheist, and I didn't think that was a 
anything I should worry about before we were married, but I was wrong. You have to be the same faith. We both decided it just wasn't to be. And so uh, mainly I decided, and um, I've been happy ever since. And a few years back, I did bury a, a man who was a Christian. I met him at our church, and we did have a happy marriage as long as he was alive. Young people, if they want happiness in their life, they need to marry someone of their own faith. His mother paid for my lessons in art. I had a wonderful mother-in-law, and I went to tailoring and dress design class with, with a teacher who was oh, one of the first Powers models in New York. So I went to her class for tailoring, and uh, my mother-in-law paid for that. How did you get into painting? Well, I just wanted to see if I had any talent in that way. I, there was a China painter here who had studied under a, a very famous China painter in, who came from Europe. And uh, she lived here in Santa Ana. So I started painting with her. What was her name? Ruth Finnemal. She was a very fine lady and my magnificent. So I took a class in, in handling a rifle at South Coast Gun Club, I think it was. It was in the 50s, I think. But you know, that's a wonderful class. Every youngster should go to that class. He taught me to respect a, a firearm and don't be afraid of it, but just respect it and treat it with respect. The Last Supper, how long did you work on that project? I, I worked on it uh, five, at least five years. I started it and worked for about two years. And I, see, I, I was copying Da Vinci, but in a different, different technique. And uh, I could not do Christ's right hand the way Da Vinci did it. And I was discouraged because I'd put the paint on and wipe it off. And so I just covered it up for about two years. And there was a little Jewish lady next door. And she says, Ann, you've got to finish that. You can't let that just lay in there. And so I was working around the house one day and something said it to me. Maybe God didn't want you to paint it the way Da Vinci painted it. Maybe he wanted you to paint it as if he, he were saying, come unto me. And when I started painting it that way, the whole picture was finished. And now I'm sending it to Billy Graham's library and I hope that others will see that quality in that painting. And, oh, when did you join Ebel? What made you want to join uh, that specific women's club? Well, it was a, it's a lovely club, and it was very active. A lot of, a lot of members at that time, and uh, I got to know a lot of people and work in the community. But I don't know, I just, I like people. If you treat people right, they'll treat you right, most generally. That was a real thrill to meet Margaret Thatcher. That was back in New York at a reception that I went to. And she was a lovely lady and a very dynamic speaker, of course. Just so friendly. She, she exuded a certain charm that you don't see too often. What advice would you give to young people who are just now trying to find their way? Get involved in politics and find out first what your country stands for, how it started out. Find the history of your own country and find out how wonderful it is to live here in freedom and to fight for that.